It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Hello, this is Dr. Justin Coulson for the Happy Families Summer Series. We've got an interview from the Bringing Up Boys Summit just a couple of months back. I spoke with Brad Marshall, soon to be Dr. Brad Marshall. He's just finishing up his PhD at the moment. He's known as the Unplugged Psychologist. If you have any screen issues, especially when it comes to boys and screens, but kids and screens generally, Brad has a host of great resources available. Check him out, the Unplugged Psychologist online. During the Bringing Up Boys Summit, I asked Brad, when should a parent be worried about their child's screen time? I mean, look, I think I think the point you make about, you know, games in the 80s and 90s, because I get asked that quite a lot by parents, you know, so many parents say, well, I gamed when I was young. There's nothing wrong with me. I turned out just fine. Um, games are different to how they were then for many different reasons, okay? So the game design is very different to what it was back then. But also one key point here before I move on to the second part of your question is, is that the fact that games are connected to the internet now, right? So in the 80s and 90s, I would play Mario Kart or Sega Mega Drive or you know NFL 92 and all these things with my brother. But I had to play with my brother or my mates to have a social connection. We'd get in the pool, we'd eat pizza, we'd do stuff in between, right? It's different today. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons is because the internet connects kids, quite often parents at home will say, well, my child won't leave you know, the room, their bedroom, wherever they are. And I say, go and see your mates. And they go, I am seeing my mates. Look, I mean, they're, they're online. Here's Jimmy, here's Mikey, right? And so what we miss then is all of that stuff in between, the pizza, the pool party, all the rest of it, right? And even some of it might've been getting in a bit of trouble, but there's all that other stuff in between. And that's what's different fundamentally about games from the 80s and 90s versus games today. But the second part of your question with what are the warning signs for parents? Look, I can go through a whole bunch of diagnostic stuff and it's really going to bore parents. So if I just break it down into some, um, hopefully some easier language that won't bore them and put them to sleep, um, what I look at in my clinic is, is developmental domains. And so what I mean by that is social development, education, behavior, health. Health is not technically a, a developmental domain, but I mean sleep, exercise, hygiene, eating, that sort of stuff, and emotional development. So there are these five main areas that I'm looking for. And, you know, my book, The Tech Diet for Your Child and Teen, goes into this in really big detail. But on the, on the macro level, if you look at something like health, if it starts impacting on your child's sleep, and what I mean by that is if they're staying up late, if they're getting up in the middle of the night to grab a device while everyone else is asleep, if they're getting up early, if your kids are waking up at 5.36 a.m. to get on before mum and dad get up, that is impacting one of those developmental domains. Now, is it going to go catastrophically wrong You know, within a week? No, probably not. But as you start to see time go by, whether it's weeks, months, a year, um, you know, the more they impact on those developmental domains, the worse it's going to get. So it, it dominoes is what I call it. So if you impact a child's sleep, then they're tired for school and they're going to be a bit stroppy. They're going to forget their homework. Then they come home and they might lash out when you ask them to do something simple, right? So I guess you're looking for all the warning signs in all of those different areas for parents. So one of the big ones um, is, is the, on the education domain is that idea of it usually starts off with kids putting in very little effort with their homework. Now you could argue that for many teenage boys, that's normal, but I guess then it graduates to not getting work done, not handing in assessments. And then even at the most, you know, the highest level it's school refusal, which is just a fancy term for not going to school so they can stay home and game. So there's a bit of a step ladder there, and those are the warning signs along the way for those ones. In a few minutes, I'd like to move into how parents might effectively respond to their sons if they are gaming and, and started to refuse to go to school or they're, they're doing other things that we would consider concerning. <laughs> Right, but but first off, let's let's just step back a little bit and 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 highlight. We're going to loosely use the term addiction because, like you said, that's what parents say. So, as you've done your research, I've certainly got a, a number of reasons why I think it's it's happening, and I might chime into the conversation as we go. But what do you see as the main 
draw cards, the main reasons that our boys are being, and, and it's different for girls. Girls just aren't drawn in in the same way that boys are. So I'm, this is a two-part question. I know that's a terrible interview process. I shouldn't do that, but two parts to this. Number one, why are boys so drawn into games and screens? And why are girls not? I mean, girls are still drawn into screens, but for different reasons and in different ways as a general average rule. So, so wh- wh- why is it happening and why the difference? Um, let, let me start with why the difference first. I'll, I'll flip it here a little bit. We don't know. Um, if I'm really honest, the differences in the gender, because yes, I, I suppose clinically, anecdotally, I can tell you uh, that certainly there are more boys that are impacted by games. Um, and girls certainly seem to get stuck a little bit more on social media and, and, and that sort of stuff here. Um, why more boys, we don't know. What I can say is that a lot of the data that comes out will tell you that, you know, gaming is a 50-50 thing between genders, that it's, it's boys and girls. What I would warn parents about is when you're reading data like that, just be careful because quite often that is actually sponsored by the gaming industry, right? It is in their interest to sort of have this idea that it's a 50-50 split. What percentage, what percentage do you see in the clinic of girls versus boys? Well, I don't think it's probably a, a good description in the clinic because me being a male child psychologist as well, um, I, I think there is a tendency for parents to assume that I would be better with boys and, and you know, a female would be better with girls, which I don't necessarily agree with. But anyway, um, I, so I, I don't think that split um, is there, but I, I guess if you just look at some of the Australian prevalence studies that are done independently, um, you are looking at at a slightly higher rate of boys gaming, um, and whether you, some studies put that at sixty or seventy percent, right? Um, I think though to to come back to your first question about why are kids or boys getting getting stuck or addicted to gaming. There are some core principles that games use, and and I could go on all day about this, right? But if I just pull out some of the big ones. So games uh, these days are much better at some of these psychological underpinnings. So if you take one of them um, called the near miss effect, and so that's the idea that you can get so close to the end and you feel like you're going to win and then you fall just short. And so if you take some of the most common games, Fortnite or CSGO or Minecraft, you know, the game algorithm will let it let anyone get right to the end, feeling like they're going to win, and then they fall just short. Now, that is a principle that they have borrowed from gambling. So poker machines will quite often do this, right? You get a king, king, king. Oh, it's a queen. I was so close. And so the neat thing about that from a game developer's perspective is it actually gives you this sense of dopamine. The lights go off, the music goes off, you feel like you've won. And that's when your boy is at home saying to mum and dad, oh, but I'm so close. I just need to go again. Or, hey, you said you were going to get off after that game, but, but he doesn't. He presses go again. And so they've lost, but they really feel like they've won. So that's just one of many psychological under- underpinnings. And the other big one I kind of touched on before is this social connection. So what we do know is that if you look at studies with functional MRI machines, what we can tell is that Gaming that is offline gives you a small amount of dopamine to the brain. Remember dopamine being that feel-good chemical, right? But gaming that is online gives you much more dopamine to the brain. And that's a very key point here because I guess what I'm saying is, um, and this is one of the reasons we we term it internet addiction, is that it is the connection and, and doesn't matter whether you're playing some guy from the United States that you've never met before or your best mate from school, it doesn't matter. It's social uh, and parents will know if they've seen their kids on Discord and all these sorts of things as well. It just amps up the social aspect of it. And so there's a bigger bit dopamine hit in that than when you and I were playing just versus a computer. So I want to add to this conversation and I'm really happy for you to either agree with me or shout me down because I think I, I, you're, you're the expert in this area. I talk to a lot of families on the parenting side of it, but the screen aspect of it, which is what, what your clinic is all about. Uh, I, I mean, I've read and studied lots and lots in this, but you're dealing with it every single day, whereas it's it's, it's a different approach for me. But I reckon there's a couple of other things. So you, you were talking about those persuasive design elements that keep you in, like the near miss. Yeah. And, and as I was thinking about that, I, 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 I thought of two others as you were speaking that just jumped out at me immediately the first one is the ease of restarting you literally you're out of the game and all you've got to do is push one button and you're straight back in yeah like there's 
There's no barriers to re-entry. It's, it's, it's just this seamless, frictionless, and straight back in. And a lot of them give you timers too, right? Next game starts in 30 seconds. If you don't jump in, your spot's gone. Your mates are all in, right? Right, yeah. Or, or you miss out on all the points that you've accrued or the, the box that you're collecting loot in or whatever it might be. So, so you miss out on these rewards. That, and you actually, I, I mean, I didn't think of that, but you get rewarded for staying in longer, right? Correct. And, and the other thing that really stands out to me, and it's just such a simple element, is that all of the games that are available on Line Track is to play, there's no clock. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you're not monitoring the time. Yeah. I mean, pretty similar to what casinos do, right? Yeah. Just don't yeah. let anyone know how time is passing by and what's happening. So I was thinking about those persuasive design elements, but then I, I, I thought about bringing it back a little further. And, and when we talk about the psychology of it, you talked about the relatedness, but two other things stood out to me. Um, the, that, that idea of the near miss, what that does is it taps into a basic psychological need that's been studied for decades uh, called the, the the need for competence. Hmm. And what, what it actually does is it gives kids a false sense of competence they feel like they're actually much more capable than perhaps they are because the game's designed to make them feel that way. And competence is a basic psychological need. It feels good. And if I'm competent or so close to being competent, that is immensely satisfying to me. So I just, I want to demonstrate my competence and continue to build my competence. And, and in the online world, you get to do that in a way that you can't in the offline world. Like to develop a real skill offline, maybe to go down to the local BMX track and learn how to jump. Yeah. That's hard and it often hurts as well. Well, and, and so, but, and what you're alluding to here is one of the other key, um, <clears throat> I guess, psychological underpinnings. Um, and that is this idea of flow. And I so, know. game designs are, are, are built so that, let me give you an example here. If a parent at home jumps on one of their kids' games as a guest, right, as a, a new guest profile, you're probably going to get a lot better weapons, a lot better armor, a lot better everything that you're doing there, right? And you try to go, oh, what are you doing? You're getting so lucky. Well, no, not really. I mean, most of it is the algorithm because it's trying to encourage you to play. It can recognize that you are a new player. And if they just made it impossible for you to play, um, this, like, this concept of flow means that if it's too difficult, you'll just get anxious and stressed and you'll give up. And so... You know, the concept of flow um, is quite often uh, associated with the distortion of time. So parents at home that go, oh, I told you, Jimmy, you only had 20 minutes left. I've only been 20 minutes. No, you've been an hour and a half, right? He, your child is probably being pretty genuine, right? They, they get stuck in this idea of flow and the game is designed that way. That's what it's supposed to do. And so you lose track of time. So, you know, there are so many more of these psychological underpinnings, right? I mean, there's a whole industry that is based on, on making this stuff what they call sticky. Um, you know, that's the term that's used in the industry. That is soon to be Dr. Brad Marshall, the unplugged psychologist from the Bringing Up Boys Summit. You can find more of the Bringing Up Boys Summit online at happyfamilies.com.au. Just search it in Google, Bringing Up Boys Summit Happy Families, and you'll find all the info you need. You can actually download the whole thing and get loads. I think there's there's 10, maybe 11 fabulous, fabulous conversations that I've had with world-leading experts about all the issues related to bringing up boys. Happyfamilies.com.au. Hey, uh, that's it for today. I'll see you again tomorrow with Kylie as we continue the Happy Families podcast summer series. 